Greetings folks and welcome to Bob of All Trades. To your right and my left is the HP Pavilion 16.1. And this laptop is a little bit more interesting than just its form factor. So watch as I break it down starting at the bottom, working our way to the top in this detailed review. Let's proceed. Getting inside the Pavilion 16.1, you have four shorter Phillips head screws in the front, four longer Phillips head screws in the rear. Using the iFixit Protect tool kit, there's a suction cup inside. This is really nice to press down on the plastic and gently pull away versus taking tools and kind of gouging away at the side. Once you pry up in this corner and this corner, you should have a pretty easy time eventually removing this bottom panel. This might take you up to a minute, but to save time, I had already done so. There are three openings for air. The one on the right is blocked off. This is where the two and a half inch drive bay goes. The ones in the middle will house cool air for your fans. And then the one on the far left will give you maybe a little bit of passive cooling for the CPU. Not an ideal setup here, but we'll talk about this and how HP tuned this uh, particular laptop so it does not thermally melt itself. In fact, thermal performance on this is quite lovely. But let's start backwards here with the battery. The 52 watt hour unit, as you can see, there's no room here for it to grow in size. Unfortunately, due to the nature of the motherboard layout. There's really nothing we can do to expand the battery unless they make a funky one that would extend over here. I guess that is a possibility, but as of right now, 52 watt hours. Realistically, three and a half hours is something I was getting out of this very consistently. Five hours watching YouTube video at 50% brightness, no problem. It was able to idle for a little over seven hours, but I wouldn't count that for anything. But some people uh, do want to know what that would be like. And the whole time the system is pinging the Wi Fi. So, you know, three and a half to five hours should be pretty realistic for most circumstances. Of course, this does not include gaming. Now, let's talk about the non soldered parts. Again, we have the two and a half inch drive. My system here is empty, so feel free to upgrade this on your own if it were me. I'd put a terabyte of a SATA SSD in there for around $100, so that would be a nice storage solution for me personally for a lot of my games and software. The half a terabyte M.2 uses Optane. The read speeds are decent. The write speeds, however, are very poor. And memory, again, not soldered down. We have two DIMMs here, 8 and 8. This is Samsung 3200 megahertz DIMMs, but it will default to 2933. Do not try to put anything faster in here. It's either going to cause compatibility issues or it's just going to default back down to 2933. The Realtek network interface card, not ideal in my opinion. I do all of my testing on Wi-Fi. 100% of the time, that's the way I've been doing things since the uh, early days of the channel. You can replace this, perhaps you wanna do so, but I personally did not have any problems using this over the last week, so there is that. Now, when it comes to the goods here, we do have a Max-Q 1660 Ti, and that's a 60 watt GPU. I do like the four point mounting solution on both the GPU and CPU for good core uniformity and contact, and these two heat pipes are massive, but you will get GPU heat transfer over to the CPU in a setup like this versus having a CPU and a GPU and the fans parting ways this way. That tends to be a little bit more thermal efficient, but honestly, the way that HP does have this tuned, this ends up working out very nice for them. The CPU is the i7 10750H, so six core, 10 generation. It is locked out of undervolting, and this whole system in general, you just can't tune it. Even when I downloaded the HP command setter, while that uh, software does recognize this laptop, you are unable to adjust any power limits or any fan control. That's just not even an option whatsoever. Now, when it comes to thermal performance and gaming performance and fan acoustics, wow, this thing, this thing was pretty good here. So let me explain. At maximum load for fan acoustics, you're going to see right around 45 maybe 46 decibels, and that's when the power limits on both systems are working at their hardest. When it comes to benchmarks, you've got Fire Strike and Time Spy. The GPU scores are pretty much in line with what I would assume would be a traditional 60 watt, 1660 Ti. No overclocking was performed whatsoever. This was just stock performance. I found Cinebench to be a little bit lower, maybe 2,700 points, maybe just a hair higher. Again, we're locked out of undervolting and because of that PL1 being at 45 watts, that tends to kick in at around the 28 second mark and that definitely slows things down, but it does keep things uh, responsibly cool by utilizing that. Here's where things get interesting for the Pavilion 16.1. If you are on a BIOS earlier than F11, you'll notice your CPU wattage during games throttle down to 30 watts after about five to seven minutes. This offered some excellent thermal performance, but will cause performance issues for CPU bound titles. 
This has been addressed with BIOS F11, and the CPU will pull up to 45 watts while the NVIDIA GPU is working. This will certainly improve frame rate performance in some titles, but will also increase temperatures as well. GPU thermal performance wasn't affected much by this BIOS update. The HP Pavilion 16.1 is about 5.2 pounds. It is all plastic, and since I got to spec this the way that I wanted to, the shadow black chassis can come with the acid green logo in keyboard color with keyboard LED or the ghost white. And the ghost white is the version I went with, has this uh, chrome circle around the HP logo and you can kind of see that like so. It's also pretty tolerant to wiping with microfiber cloths and that's something you're going to need pretty often on this all plastic chassis it tends to leave uh, fingerprint oils very easily. Now when we compare this physical size to let's say a RP17 from Electronics. You've got the 17.3 inch laptop versus the 16.1. You're definitely getting a little less width on the 16.1. You'll have no problem getting this 16.1 to fit in just about any 15.6 inch gaming laptop bag, no problem. And the depth of the two is nearly identical, but when we compare this to another thin bezel laptop, such as this 15. 0.6 inch Clevo based chassis. Again, the depth of the three is pretty close. I mean, we're talking just, just the smallest bit, but the width, as you can clearly see, there is, you know, substantial width difference, especially in the 17.3, the 16.1, 15.6, very close to one another. That's pretty awesome. The port selection and port placement. There's really nothing on the left-hand side, and we need more ports over here. USB 3, we have the uh, barrel power ports, which has the 90 degree bend on it for the power supply unit, and this is a 200 watt power supply unit, which is more than enough for the Pavilion 16.1 with these parts, so no issues there. But on the left-hand side, we have an ultra high-speed one card reader. The card does insert itself all the way into the chassis and it is spring-loaded, so I do appreciate that should you wish to leave it in there while you stow this away in your laptop bag. The combo headphone microphone port is here. The USB-C will do data and DisplayPort 1.4, but it does not charge the system and this is not Thunderbolt 3. The local area network, the LAN port with the tab flipped down, least of the worries here, the fact that this is on the right-hand side along with an HDMI. These are very bulky cords to be on the right-hand side where your mouse hand typically is. We get one more USB 3. I personally need three and would prefer four. This system has two. You may have to use an adapter here, perhaps not the end of the world, but the location of this port and this port, the HDMI and the LAN are not ideal, and that goes for 99% of uh, individuals out there. Now, as far as the cooling, the exhaust, it is out the back, but you can still use this with the lid closed as a docking station. They were clever enough to allow the system to breathe right out the back. So nice job there, HP. The pavilion still has a pretty elegant look to it, uh, and you can use it for multi-purposes, and having it with the lid closed is a nice quality of life feature, so we do appreciate that. Now, opening up the pavilion with one hand, sometimes it will do it, it's real close. Okay, now you're showing off for me. All right, excellent job there. It comes to life really quickly. However, it doesn't sleep all that well. I woke up last night in the middle of the night. I came downstairs and the lid was closed and this thing was on at like two in the morning and I have heard it doing this three times now in the last week. So perhaps that's a problem I may be able to solve, but as of right now, it comes to life quickly from sleep, but it doesn't always behave at sleep. So sort of like my children when they were young. This whole entire, entire deck area is plastic. The keyboard, you cannot change the timing of this. Within 30 seconds, it will turn itself off. And, I don't know, kind of annoying. That goes when it's plugged in or when it's unplugged. The trackpad is plastic. Oh, it doesn't rattle. I'm gonna put the mic right by this, listen. Oh, it's nice. It's a really nice trackpad, actually. But it is plastic, Windows Precision Drivers, and it's, it's almost centered, despite there being a number pad. It took me a little bit to get used to this, but all in all, pretty decent, you know, Windows Precision plastic trackpad, and I like that it doesn't rattle. That's really pleasant, and it's sad that I have to say that. For the most part, I am enjoying the keyboard. The travel distance is shallow, but the keys themselves are quiet. The white LED lighting is bright. Island-style, full-size, enter keys on the right. 
The only thing that was a little weird were the arrow keys, top and bottom, were squished together, and it took me maybe two or three days to get used to that. I've been using other laptops recently where these were pushed down and a little bit larger, so it really wasn't that big of a deal. Now, up here are actually the speaker grills, and it doesn't pass the DPC latency. It just, it just did not do that, but have a listen to the audio. It lacks bass, but it's loud and it's clear. It's not that bad, actually. Check this out. Now moving up to the display, this is a full HD 144 hertz IPS type. This is a BOE panel. I'll put the part number up here for you. Came in at 98% standard RGB at 317 nits. This is a really good panel. According to panel look, the response time on this was around 13 milliseconds. It was pretty indistinguishable from maybe a seven or nine millisecond panel. I've used a few three millisecond panels out there and the difference between three and 13 is just barely noticeable, but by no means was this a deal breaker for all of my first person shooter titles and I had no problem enjoying this display. Now, when you move up to the very top, you have got the webcam and microphone built in. Have a look and listen. All right, here we are, 720p webcam and microphone. I won't be able to max out the fans as this laptop does not have that option, but I made sure that the air conditioning unit and AC is running right here. AC unit's right outside the window, so maybe it can pick up that noise. Keyboard strokes are gonna sound like this. Now, in my office where I'm recording this right now, it's very dimly lit. So you may see a lot of um, noise, compression type stuff in the background. I did the same thing in my last review. So let's see what happens when we take this into an environment with some appropriate lighting. It's amazing what different lighting can do. 5,000 Kelvin that we have above us here. We have five bulbs. There's two of them right there. And clearly, no pun intended, I find this to be a much better video image. However, this might not be a realistic or viable solution for you. So what would you prefer? More of a realistic office environment that I was just showcasing or something with a more a vibrant daylight type light to it? Let me know in the comment section below. All right, so two things I want to touch base on. The port placement, not ideal at all. And some manufacturers have addressed this by flipping the motherboard around. That would not be a good solution here, so it's just going to ruin the wonderful accessibility and upgradability that we have on this laptop. So perhaps in the future, maybe rework that motherboard so we can get the dominant ports over on the left-hand side. And the quality of life that that would bring to this laptop would be spectacular. But speaking of quality of life, the F11 BIOS that brought the CPU performance up to the standard that we can expect from hardware inside, I think the support page should also have the F10 BIOS with a little statement below stating that if you would like a cooler or quieter running laptop at the expense of a little bit of CPU performance, install this BIOS. That would be an awesome quality of life for the consumer and HP, you've already done the work, so why not just give the accessibility to the community of offering both BIOS for the consumer, or give us a software solution for this laptop that will allow us to, um, you know, change the TDP of the CPU. Or you've also done it in the BIOS before on an HP Omen that I reviewed back in 2018. You guys are capable. You're definitely capable. Just offering some suggestions that I think the community would definitely appreciate. All right, folks, that's going to do it. That's how I broke it down on the Pavilion 16.1. I'm Bob of all trades, and I hope to see you in the next video.